All right, welcome everybody. Um, this uh, talk for today's ACM Tech Talk uh, is a webcast. It's part of ACM's commitment to lifelong learning and professional development, serving a global membership of computing professionals and students. I'm Worley, your moderator for today, founder and CEO of Strangeworks, a quantum computing startup that makes the power of quantum computing easily accessible and available to all. And for more on my background, you can check out my bio and the widget on your screen. Um, for those of you who may be unfamiliar with ACM, or what it has to offer, here's a little bit of information. ACM offers educational and professional development resources that bolster skills and enhance career opportunities. Our members can stay competitive in the constantly changing world of computing with a wide range of ACM Learning Center resources that you can check out at learning.acm.org. You can see some of the highlights on your screen. And ACM recognizes the role of computing in driving the innovations that sustain competitiveness in a global environment. ACM provides access to ACM Digital Library, the world's most comprehensive database of computer literature, leading publications and global conferences that draw top experts from a broad spectrum of computing topics, support in education and research, including curriculum development, teaching, training, the ACM Turing and ACM Prize in Computing Awards, and finally, last but not least, the ACM Code of Ethics, which is a great collection of the principles and guidelines designed to help computing professionals make ethically responsible decisions in their professional practice. ACM enables its members to solve critical problems using new technologies that enrich our lives and advance our society in the digital age. Before we get started, I'd like to quickly mention a few housekeeping items shown on the slide in front of you. If you have questions at any time, please type them in the Q&A box and click Submit. I'll be organizing the questions for Scott as he speaks, and we'll get to those and as soon as he's done, and we'll get to as many of them as possible. This session will be recorded and archived. You'll receive an automatic email notification when it becomes available. And check learning.acm.org for updates on this and other upcoming webcasts. At the end of the presentation, you'll see a survey open on your screen. Please take a moment to fill that out and help us improve the Tech Talks. You may also open the link uh, to the survey at any time from the resource window below. Today's presentation is Quantum Compu Computational Supremacy by Scott Aronson. He's an amazing speaker. Tell you a little bit about him. Scott's the David J. Bruton uh, Centennial Professor of Computer Science at the University of Texas at Austin. Before coming to UT Austin, he spent nine years as a professor in electrical engineering and computer science at MIT. Uh, Aronson's research in theoretical computer science has focused mainly on the capabilities and limits of quantum computers. And his first book, Quantum Computing Since Democritus, was published in 2013 by Cambridge University Press. He's received the National Science Foundation's Alan T. Waterman Award, the United States P. Case Award, and the Tomasani uh, Chesley uh, Prize in Physics. Most recently, he's a recipient of the 2020 ACM Prize in Computing, and he is also a fellow of the ACM. Scott, without further ado, take it away. Okay. Let's see. Um... One second. Um, all right, you can see that. So, uh, so uh, thank you so much um, uh, to uh, um, ACM, uh, to uh, uh, Worley, uh, my fellow Austinite, uh, for that kind introduction. Uh, it's really an honor to be invited uh, to give this talk. Now, this talk uh, is called Quantum Computational Supremacy. Uh, I'm well aware that not everyone likes that term. Uh, you know, some people feel like uh, it overpromises. You know, other people are, are worried that, that someone might be uh, reminded of uh, uh, of uh, bad kinds of supremacy. So, you know, they've taken to calling it quantum advantage, superiority, uh, inimitability. Um, you know, my, my feeling was that once we go down this road, well, you know, advantage, superiority, you know, they also have some unsavory connotations. And uh, as for inimitability, that's just too hard to pronounce. Uh, so, you know, and rather than constantly ceding, you know, otherwise fine words to, to racists, you know, why not proudly reclaim them, you know, and use them for things like quantum computing, that people from all backgrounds and all cultures are working together uh, to make real. Okay, but I can see that I'm losing this, this battle. So in this talk, I'll sometimes say quantum supremacy, just because I'm so used to calling it that for the last decade. But I'll also use other terms like quantum advantage and quantum speed up. 
Okay, so to talk about uh, quantum computing, uh, you know, for a broad audience, I need to say something about what is quantum mechanics. Uh, and the way that I like to think about it, quantum mechanics is a strange set of rules that were discovered in the 1920s uh, for calculating the probability that something is going to happen. Uh, so, you know, it's almost not even physics. It's an operating system that, you know, as far as we know, everything else uh, in nature, you know, runs on as application programs. Uh, you know, you may have heard that there's some difficulty in porting uh, general relativity to this OS, but, you know, um, everything else runs great on it. Um, and uh, I, I like to joke that, that, that uh, quantum mechanics uh, is much, much simpler, you know, once you take the physics out of it, which is what, you know, we uh, like to do in this interdisciplinary field of quantum computing and quantum information. So the central thing that quantum mechanics says about the world is that the state of any isolated physical system, you know, a photon, an atom, uh, even in principle, uh, the entire universe, uh, can be described by a vector, in particular, a unit vector of complex numbers, which are called amplitudes. Okay, so to take an example, a qubit or a quantum bit which is the basic building block of a quantum computer, uh, is just a bit that has some amplitude to be in the state zero and some amplitude to be in the state one. Okay, so the way that a physicist would write it would be as uh, A times the state zero plus B times the state one uh, using uh, these funny angle brackets, which are called cats. Uh, a math or CS person could also write it as simply a vector. You know, a vector of two complex numbers, A and B. Okay, and this vector is normalized. You know, it is a unit vector. Okay, so uh, the possible states of a single qubit uh, correspond to the unit circle. Okay, or, you know, if we include the imaginary components, then actually a sphere. Okay, but uh, we could identify the horizontal direction with, you know, the state zero, uh, the vertical direction with the state one, and then we have a whole bunch of intermediate possibilities, like this zero plus one over square root of two, which we would call an equal superposition of the zero state and the one state. Okay? Now, the rule is if you measure a qubit, you know, if you look at it in a way to ask it whether it's a zero or a one, then it will randomly snap to one of them. OK, so it will tell you that it is zero with probability uh, equal to the squared absolute value of A. It will tell you that it's one with probability equal to the squared absolute value of B. And whichever one it tells you it is, then thereafter it is that. OK, so. Uh, measurement uh, famously uh, collapses the state. Okay, but besides just measuring a qubit, uh, you can do other things to it. In particular, you can apply norm preserving linear transformations uh, to the vector of amplitudes. Okay, we call these unitary transformations. And these are, you know, the quantum version of, of gates of sort of the basic logic operations that we would do uh, to, to perform a computation. Okay, so just to take one example, uh, here's an example of a, of a two by two unitary matrix uh, that you know, acts on a single qubit uh, by just taking its state vector and rotating it by 45 degrees counterclockwise. Okay, I'm, just, I'm calling it R. Okay, and when we apply these unitary transformations, uh, they can have the effect of uh, in creating interference between amplitudes. That is, you know, we may have to calculate an amplitude by summing up a bunch of terms. Some of them could be positive and others could be negative, or they could be pointing in all different directions in the complex plane. And when that happens, they could cancel each other out. OK, uh, that is the central signature of quantum behavior. That is you know, the thing that does not happen with conventional probabilities, uh, the, these cancellations, but that does happen with quantum mechanics. OK, so as a simple example, suppose I start with the state z uh, zero, so a zero qubit, and I apply that 45 degree rotation operation R to it twice in succession. 
Well, the first time I apply it, I'm going to rotate by 45 degrees. So now I'm uh, in equal superposition of zero and one. Uh, what about the second time I apply it? Well, by linearity, I can think of R as acting on the zero and the one components separately. The zero component, again, gets rotated to zero plus one, but the one component gets rotated to minus zero plus one. Okay, so now when we expand it all out, what we see is that there were two different contributions to the amplitude of the zero state, but one of them is positive and the other is negative. So they cancel each other out. And all that is left is the one state, which, you know, indeed matches uh, the fact that, you know, if I take, if I start it horizontal and I rotate twice by 45 degrees, then I end up at vertical. I end up at the one state. Okay, but what we've seen is interference, right? The, uh, the, there were, uh, in effect, two different pathways by which we could have gotten back down to the zero state but their amplitudes canceled each other out, okay? Now, uh, crucially, if we have not just one qubit, but many qubits, let's say N of them, then uh, uh, the state of that qubit, uh, of those qubits, will in general have the form, the sum over all possible n-bit strings x of ax times x, okay? So this will be a vector uh, not of 2n amplitudes, but of 2 to the n power, 2 to the n amplitudes. Okay, uh, so, and the reason this is true is that in general, the state of many qubits could be what we call entangled, uh, which simply means, you know, not factorizable into separately, you know, a state of qubit one and then a state of qubit two, you know, and so forth, right? Just like classical bits you know, uh, could have a probability distribution that is correlated, or, you know, when you learn about one bit, it would tell you something about the other bits. Um, qubits can also be correlated, okay? The quantum version of correlation is what we call entanglement, okay? And this entanglement leads to exponential growth in the number of amplitudes that I need to, uh, to describe the state of n qubits. So to take an example, if I had a thousand qubits, and, you know, we're still talking about a very small physical system, right? Like this could be, you know, uh, some small molecule with just, you know, uh, uh, you know, a thousand or so electrons in it. Then um, to describe the state of those thousand qubits, I need two to the thousand complex numbers, okay? Two to the thousand amplitudes. Now that is much, much more than the number of subatomic particles, you know, in the entire observable universe. You know, so I, I drew these galaxies to, you know, give you a sense of, you know, just to keep track of the state of, you know, a small number of particles. Quantum mechanics says that nature off to the side somewhere has to maintain some scratch paper, you know, with, with more parameters than you could explicitly write down in the whole observable universe. And so this is really the key fact, in a sense. I mean, this is the reason why quantum mechanics famously seems to be exponentially difficult, intractable to simulate using a conventional computer, you know, a classical computer. And this is why building a quantum computer is, you know, a computer that itself would be made of qubits, you know, might uh, be able to, to do better uh, for, for some tasks. Okay, but having said this, I have to urge everyone to beware. Okay, because a quantum computer is not just free exponential parallelism. Okay, it's not just like a classical computer, but one that gets to try every possible solution uh, in a different parallel universe. I mean, uh, for for 20 years, you know, I have been, you know, trying to to to, to push back on you know the. Uh, pointy-haired bosses, so to speak, who, who want that to be the case, whether they're, you know, in the business world or the government world or, you know, the journalism world, and who want to just round quantum computing down to you get to try every possible answer in parallel. But the truth is actually a lot more interesting and more subtle than that. It is uh, sort of weirder than any science fiction writer would have had the imagination to make up. Okay, because here's the issue. You know, uh, it's true that you can create these superpositions involving an exponential number of amplitudes. But then at some point, you have to look at your computer to see what is the output. Okay, and when you observe 
The rules of quantum mechanics say that you just see a single n-bit string x. Okay, and so a single string gets randomly sampled with the probability of each x being the squared absolute value of its amplitude. Okay, and what this means is that you know, if we just created an equal superposition over all the possible strings, then when we look, we would just see a random string, you know, which is not useful. We didn't need a quantum computer for that. Okay, so the only hope of getting a speed up, an advantage from a quantum computer, is to exploit the phenomenon of interference okay, uh, in order to boost the amplitudes of the outputs x that you actually want while suppressing the amplitudes for the outputs that you don't want. Okay, so at the core of every quantum algorithm is some kind of choreography where uh, uh, you're trying to arrange things so that for each right answer, all the different contributions to their amplitudes are pointing the same way, you know, have amplitudes that all add up and reinforce. Whereas for each wrong answer, the contributions to their amplitudes are pointing in different directions so that they cancel each other out. Okay. Now, uh, this is a weird hammer that nature gives us. You know, we should only expect it to be able to hit some special nails. Because, you know, we should only expect quantum speedups for, for some special tasks. You know, we should count ourselves lucky if, if this uh, really g gives a big speed up for anything at all. Okay, so now this brings me to, well, what is quantum supremacy or quantum advantage or whatever you want to call it? So the term refers to the first use of a quantum computer uh, to perform some well-defined mathematical task faster, uh, ideally much faster than we know how to do that same task with any classical computer that currently exists on Earth. Okay, now, uh, notice that I did not say a useful task. Okay, let's you know, leave usefulness for later. Okay, let's just concentrate for now on the reality of a quantum speedup. Okay, so, uh, you know, now, but what do we mean by a quantum speedup? You know, I mean, uh, s someone, you could imagine a chemist or a physicist pointing to some uh, complicated molecule and, and saying, well, you know, um, the uh, Schrodinger equation, you know, the quantum mechanical equations for this molecule are so hard, you know, for you to solve. So I'm going to define this molecule to be a computer that achieves quantum supremacy for the task of simulating itself. Well, I would like to do a little bit better than that. OK, uh, in particular, what I want is a programmable device. So, you know, a device that could take many different inputs and crucially, where, you know, our quantum device and a classical computer that is competing against our device uh, can be given exactly the same input. OK, and they they both have to perform exactly the same task, OK, which which is just a mathematical function of that input that they both get. Okay, and then you know I want to see, of course, that the quantum computer does it faster. You know, even then, uh, uh, you know, the 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 largest supercomputers, let's say, that are uh, uh, now available to us. Okay, so, but now not only do we want the quantum computer to win in this sort of race, but you know we care a lot about how it wins. Okay, so we would like to rule out any explanation for why the quantum computer was faster other than it was faster because it exploited these two to the n amplitudes, you know, this uh, superposition state, this, you know, enormous dimensionality of our vector space. Okay, uh, we want to uh, rule out kind of any, any, you know, uh, incidental reason, like, you know, it was faster just because, you know, uh, you always get a speed up when you build some special purpose hardware, you know, even if there aren't quantum effects. Okay, so um, so that's that's quantum supremacy. Now, you know, what people sometimes ask, what's the point of it? And, you know, but to me, that's almost self-evident, right? It's like, you know, what was the point of the Wright Brothers airplane? Okay, uh, you know, you want to demonstrate that something is possible. You know, meaning not merely that the laws of physics allow it, but that, you know, we can actually achieve it using the technological resources that we now have on Earth. Um, 
And, you know, I, 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 I like to joke that for me personally, you know, the number one application of a quantum computer has always been simply refuting the quantum computing skeptics. Okay, just uh, uh, you know, refuting the people who said it was impossible, right? And uh, uh, you know, once we can do that, then you know, I hope that quantum computers will also be useful for various other applications. And to me, that that's that's icing on the cake. All right, so now you know, let me give you a brief history of quantum supremacy or quantum advantage, you know, uh, omitting a, a, a lot of important things, just what's, what's important for, for my narrative today. Okay, so in 1982, Richard Feynman gave a famous lecture where he uh, proposed the idea of a, uh, a quantum computer, and he was only really able to suggest one application for such a device, namely that they could be exponentially faster than classical computers for the task of simulating quantum mechanics itself, which, you know, of course, was something that greatly interested him. And still today, I think that uh, quantum simulation is arguably the most important practical application of quantum computers that we know about, you know, besides just proving the point. OK, uh, but it wasn't really taken up by uh, uh, many computer scientists, you know, until uh, the uh, early 1990s. Uh, and then um, um, Bernstein and Vazirani uh, finally, you know, uh, um, um, looked at quantum computing from the standpoint of theoretical computer science. You know, they defined a complexity class uh, called BQP which stands for bounded error quantum polynomial time, uh, which is just the quantum generalization of the class P. It's like the class of all the decision problems that are efficiently solvable, you know, using quantum mechanical resources. Okay, and they studied where it fits in with well-known classical complexity classes, you know, like P and NP. Uh, so, not surprisingly, we don't uh, uh, fully know yet. You know, we know that BQP contains classical P. Uh, we don't know its relationship to NP. It's believed to be unlikely that BQP contains the NP complete problems. Uh, in fact, BQP and NP might just be incomparable uh, with one another. Okay, but uh, you know, we can now pose the fundamental question in very precise terms. You know, is BQP larger than P? Are there problems in quantum polynomial time that are not in classical polynomial time? Okay, and um, of course, a, a uh, profound discovery about that question was made in 1994 when Peter Shore discovered his fast quantum algorithm for factoring integers. Okay, uh, you know, he proved that factoring is in BQP. And, you know, therefore, incidentally, that a, a scalable quantum computer, if it were built, uh, could break almost all of the public key cryptography that is currently used to protect the Internet. OK, now, of course, that immediately raised the question of, well, how hard would it actually be to build a scalable quantum computer? And um, that was uh, quickly addressed uh, as well with the theory of quantum error correction and quantum fault tolerance. And you know, the upshot of these uh, remarkable theoretical developments was that building a quantum computer able to run Shor's algorithm should be, you know, quote unquote, merely a technological problem. Right? Uh, you know, even if your, all of your components are subject to some level of noise, you know, as long as the noise is small enough, then you can do error correction uh, to deal with it. Um, unfortunately, you know, the, 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 the physical error rate has to be very, very low, certainly many orders of magnitude lower than anyone knew how to achieve in the 1990s. Okay, but that set the, uh, uh, much of the agenda of, of, of quantum computing in the 25 years since. Right, you know, can you engineer devices that can actually apply unitary transformations and measurements uh, with a low enough error that you could then, you know, use fault tolerance to actually scale up to, you know, as many qubits as, as you would like, uh, you know, thousands or millions of them, and uh, as many operations on them as you have time to do. Uh, so, um, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, and, 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 you know, lots and lots of progress was made on that, you know, both on the 
theoretical and on the experimental side. Um, then um, in um, 2011, uh, my then student, Alex Arkhipov, and I uh, took kind of a different tack, uh, which is, you know, we said, is there a faster way if you just want to demonstrate quantum supremacy? Okay, if you just want to get a clear speed advantage over a classical computer, then can you shortcut, you know, having to build a full scalable quantum computer able to run Shor's algorithm, for example, and just, you know, do something simpler. So we had a proposal uh, that we called boson sampling, which was a way to use very, very rudimentary optical devices, you know, uh, uh, beam splitters, uh, um, th things like that, uh, in order to sample from a probability distribution. Okay, in this case, a distribution over where a bunch of photons uh, would land after you know, uh, passing through these beam splitters. Okay, but the, the sort of key uh, innovation here was to switch our attention from problems like factoring with a single right answer to sampling tasks. Okay, problems where you know, the desired output is a sample from some specified probability distribution over n-bit strings. Okay, and what we showed was that even these very rudimentary quantum devices could sample from probability distributions such that if a classical computer could sample from those same distributions in polynomial time, then that would have dramatic implications for classical complexity theory. Okay, it would lead to things like the collapse of the polynomial time hierarchy, if you know or care what, uh, what that is. Uh, um, now, uh, we didn't rule out that, you know, there could be a fast classical algorithm that would approximately sample these distributions, you know, that we did study that question in detail. And, you know, that, is, that has been a, a huge question ever since. Okay, we, you know, we gave some evidence that, you know, there were distributions, including boson sampling ones, that, that could be hard for a classical computer to even approximately sample. Okay, and uh, uh, about the same time, uh, Bremner, Joza, and Shepard uh, independently uh, came up with similar ideas okay, uh, for a different model than boson sampling, what they called IQP. Um, and, and then a year later, uh, John Preskill uh, coined the term quantum supremacy, uh, uh, for, for better or worse, to describe things like what we had proposed, like boson sampling or like IQP, uh, proposals for you know, demonstrating a, an exponential quantum speed up, not necessarily for a useful task, but for some contrived sampling benchmark where you know, we, we can figure out how to do it with a very kind of rudimentary uh, quantum computer and also where we can give good theoretical evidence that there is not a fast classical algorithm to sample from the same distribution. Okay, so, um, and then, you know, this became a goal for the experimentalists to aim for. And uh, in 2014, uh, Google uh, hired uh, John Martinez, who is, you know, uh, maybe, you know, one of the, the, the most famous uh, uh, quantum computing experimentalists in the world. And they formed a lab uh, in Santa Barbara um, with like 75 people. And uh, they uh, started building um, um, superconducting qubit devices uh, that, that uh, with an explicit aim of doing the first ever uh, practical demonstration of this quantum supremacy. They, and, uh, you know, they, they, they wanted to do something like boson sampling, but more adapted to uh, the systems that they were building, which were not based on photonics, but, you know, which were based on uh, two-dimensional arrays of superconducting qubits. Okay, so um, uh, student uh, Li Ji Chen and I, a few years later, managed to adapt the theory of boson sampling to superconducting systems like the one that uh, we, we then knew that Google was building. Okay, now in fall of 2019, uh, Google finally uh, had a result, uh, which they announced, uh, a, you know, cover article in Nature. Uh, they were able to build a chip with uh, 53 superconducting qubits, actually 54, but one of them didn't work. Uh, uh, so, you know, what, what that means is that the number of amplitudes to keep track of the state is two to the 53 power, which is about nine quadrillion. 
Okay, and uh, you know, by running this chip for about three minutes, they were able to collect millions of independent samples from some probability distribution D over 53 bit strings, which you know they can characterize, and which you know, given enough effort, one can uh, uh, sample using using a, a giant classical computer. Okay, uh, and you know they they estimated that this would be really really hard to simulate classically. Uh, a few weeks later, uh, IBM posted a rebuttal paper. Okay, and uh, IBM is uh, one of Google's main competitors in superconducting qubits, and uh, they hit back and said, "Well, you know, here is how we could classically spoof Google's results in only 2.5 days." But you know, uh, admittedly, they're um, proposed a uh, classical approach would require using Summit, which is the literally largest supercomputer on Earth, uh, which has uh, about, um, um, 250 uh, petabytes of, of hard disk, which is enough to just explicitly write down a vector of, of nine quadrillion complex numbers. So you know, that's what they were proposing to do, just this you know, enormous brute force. And you know, they didn't actually do it, because you know, it's just not uh, uh, that cheap or easy to get <laughs> 2.5 days on, on the world's biggest supercomputer. Okay, but uh, you know the debate about just how hard or easy is it to spoof uh, uh, um, Google's quantum supremacy experiment has continued to to rage on uh, for for the past couple of years. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, you know, there have been more quantum supremacy announcements. So in particular, uh, a group at USTC in uh, Hefei, China, um, last year uh, reported a demonstration of boson sampling, which was Mayan Arkhipov's original proposal, you know, the one based on optics. And they did that by building an optical table uh, you know, with hundreds of beam splitters through which they were able to send 50 to 70 photons at once and then measure, you know, where all of those photons uh, ended up, you know, the sort of correlated probability distribution over the places where they land. Um, now, uh, um, um, it, it, just in the past year, they have improved their boson sampling uh, uh, experiment to, you know, now deal with like uh, about 110 photons. And they have also uh, done sam a sampling-based quantum supremacy experiment using superconducting qubits, you know, just like uh, uh, Google had done, right? So they're they're really on a tear here. And uh, so they they uh, first announced that they did it with 56 qubits, you know, three more than Google. <laughs> and then just last night, uh, as I was writing this talk, they posted a paper on the archive saying, no, they've now done it with 60 qubits. Uh, here's the uh, the archive reference. Okay, uh, skeptics, you know, meanwhile have continued trying to poke holes in these experiments. You know, which basically means you know coming up with classical algorithms that can uh, spoof the results. You know, uh, faster th uh, than was thought. Um, you know, and, and they've made progress on that. But you know, the uh, the the uh, hope. I guess of the experimentalists is that you know their devices are are going to be improving faster than than the classical algorithms can improve. Okay, so so now I come to the question: Well, what exactly did Google and USTC do? Let me focus for simplicity on the superconducting qubits experiments. Okay, so uh, so what they do is you know they build these chips. Uh, that look kind of like that picture I drew, where the, each X represents one superconducting qubit. So, you know, one sort of uh, coil under which, you know, through which a current can flow uh, in two different states that you uh, uh, label as zero and one. Okay, the, uh, the little um, 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 uh, rectangles uh, are... Uh, uh, the couplings between neighboring qubits, where you know you can do a two qubit gate, you can uh, you know interact them and, and uh, entangle those two qubits. Okay, and so so these are all etched onto a chip, which looks like a pretty normal computer chip. Okay, but it's then placed into a dilution refrigerator, uh, which looks like an upside down wedding cake if you uh, uh, see one in the lab. And uh, the chip is cooled to about a hundredth of a degree above absolute zero. OK, 
Okay, and at that very low temperature, uh, the qubits are able to behave as qubits to maintain their quantum superposition states for you know a few tens of microseconds. Okay, which is not very long, but you know uh, long enough to do what we want. Okay, so now what we do is a, a quantum circuit C, by which I just mean you know the sequence of couplings to apply, like you know the program to apply to these qubits is chosen uniformly at random. Okay, so it's just a random sequence of operations. Okay, and you know operations can be done on many many pairs of qubits in parallel. Okay, but uh, you know we because of the noise in the system, we are limited in uh, what depth we can manage. Right, we only have a few tens of microseconds while the quantum state is maintained. That's enough to do about twenty, or you know, in the most recent experiments, twenty-four uh, layers of operations. Okay, so over and over, what we do is we initialize all the qubits to let's say the zero state. Then we apply that circuit C to them, and then we simply measure each qubit in the zero one basis. You know, to see is it a zero or a one. Each time we do that, we get an independent sample, say S sub i, from that distribution D. Okay, so now after just a few minutes, we have samples S one up to S k for k as large as a few million. Okay, but now I come to a crucial question: How do we check? Whether these samples, these SIs, actually came from our distribution D. I mean, for that matter, how would a skeptic check whether a quantum computer was actually used or needed at all to generate these samples? All right. Well, uh, we need to do some kind of test, some kind of statistical benchmark to to check that. So the um, the the test that Google applied was one of the you know the simplest ones you could imagine. You say you know using lots of classical computer power, you know like two to the n uh, uh, classical resources, and using your knowledge of the circuit C, and using you know as much time as you need, like days or weeks, you calculate a certain number, uh, which we, uh, uh, they call the linear cross entropy benchmark, or LXEB. Okay, and I've defined the number here, uh, and it's it's simply sort of uh, um, the normalized sum of the probabilities that each of the samples that you saw would have been generated by an ideal version of your quantum circuit. Okay, so you calculate these sort of ideal amplitudes for each of the samples that you saw, and you check whether that, sum, that gives you a sum that is sort of noticeably large. Okay, and here's the situation. Uh, if you, suppose that someone cheated, they didn't have a quantum computer, and in fact they just generated these samples as completely random strings, just random garbage. Then you would expect this score, this LXEB, to be about one, right? Because each of these probabilities will be like two to the minus n in expectation. Okay. Now, if someone used a perfect quantum computer with no noise, then you can calculate. That this LXEB score will be about two. Okay, and intuitively, that is because some uh, um, samples, some S sub i's, have larger probabilities than 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 others, just because of the sort of random vicissitudes of quantum interference. Right? For some S sub i's, you know, there's a little bit more cancellation. Uh, among all of the contributions to their amplitudes than there is for others. And so some of them will have probabilities of, let's say, three over two to the n. Others will have probabilities of only a half over two to the n, and so forth. So now you can do statistics, and you can check, am I preferentially seeing the output strings that were predicted to have the somewhat larger probabilities? And that's exactly what this test does. Now, uh, drum roll, you know, Google's uh, uh, result of their experiment is that they were able to achieve a linear cross entropy score of about 1.002, okay? And the USTC experiment, it was smaller. It was about 1.0005, okay? So, you know, they're getting scores that are just slightly, slightly above the sort of trivial classical score. But they are detectably above. It. You know, you can sort of prove to you know ten or twenty sigmas that you know yes, you know that that one point zero zero two really is larger than one. 
Okay, and now you know we have theoretical you know results that suggest that you know that seems like plausibly enough for quantum computational supremacy. Okay, so now you know the key theoretical question, if you like, is well, how hard is it to achieve similar linear cross entropy scores via a classical algorithm? Does that take time that is exponential in n? Not surprisingly, we're not sure. I mean, you know, we can't even prove things like P is not equal to P space in, in theoretical computer science, but, you know, it seems plausible. Um, my uh, then student, uh, Sam Gunn, and I uh, were able to give a hardness reduction for this linear cross entropy benchmark that shows that if you had any classical algorithm that was faster than brute force and that, you know, was able to spoof the quantum computer. So produce samples S1 up to SK with some linear cross entropy score that is sort of detectably bounded above one, then you could convert that algorithm into uh, another better than brute force classical algorithm that would actually estimate amplitudes in random quantum circuits and would do that with sort of a better variance than you know the trivial estimator. So you really would have to get some you know insight into just the general problem of how do you simulate a random quantum circuit. All right. So now you know I'm going to uh, conclude this talk with a brief FAQ. You know some of the questions that I get most often about um, you know, these quantum supremacy experiments, and then I'll be happy to take other questions. Okay, so first question, well, is, you know, should we count this as quantum supremacy or quantum advantage? You know, has that been achieved or not? You know, I would say that, you know, it is, uh, there is now a very plausible claim to it, uh, but it's not yet clear. Okay, and the main reason is that people continue to design better classical spoofing algorithms. Hey, so far, all of the spoofing algorithms that we've seen over the past couple of years, you know, either they still take several days on a, on a big supercomputer, so, you know, the, which means that the quantum computer is getting you know, at least a several orders of magnitude speed advantage, or you know, they produce linear cross-entropy scores that are sort of uh, better than one, but not as good as the quantum computer was able to get. You know, just very, very slightly better than one, or um, they can be defeated by just adding something very simple. Like, you know, if you just check that all of the samples S sub i are sufficiently far from each other, then that that uh, defeats one of the the, the spoofing uh, attempts that was proposed. Um, but you know, but now at the same time, as I said, as the classical algorithms improve, the experiments are also rapidly improving. So I think the way to think about it is not you know, of quantum supremacy as a single event, like, you know, landing on the moon or something. Okay, you should think of it as a several years long process where, you know, we start in a state where for these sample, even for these sort of contrived sampling benchmarks, classical computers are just clearly unequivocally faster. And, you know, hopefully, presumably, we end in a state where the quantum computers are just unequivocally faster for these sampling benchmarks. And it's not even an argument, you know, anymore. Uh, but then, you know, there is some several years where, where you still can't argue about it. You know, you know, a little bit like uh, Kasparov versus Deep Blue with chess or something like that. You know, and I would say we are, we are somewhere in this transitional era right now. Okay, second question. Um, is the quantum speed up scalable? Is, you know, you know, does it really scale to arbitrary numbers of qubits? Uh, the answer is no, not yet. And the reason is that we don't yet have any error correction or fault tolerance on these qubits. Okay, these are just completely bare, uncorrected qubits. And without error correction, we know that this linear cross entropy score is going to fall rapidly with n. It's going to go down like one plus one over some exponential in n. And as long as it's decreasing so rapidly, then classical algorithms you know, that are already known will ultimately be able to spoof the quantum computer in polynomial in n time. Okay, so. Uh, 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 so, you know, to get true scaling to, you know, thousands or millions of qubits, not surprisingly, yeah, you're going to need quantum error correction. Okay, but what has been demonstrated 
even without error correction, I think is already a pretty big deal, okay? And it is that, you know, interference in a superposition of two to the 50th or even two to the 60th amplitudes can actually be harnessed to do a computation faster. Okay, you know, and this was one of the main points at issue. This was one of the main things that many of the quantum computing skeptics uh, already denied. And, you know, we now have an answer to that question. Okay, so third question. Or, you know, does, does this mean that we have quantum speed ups that are useful for anything yet? Uh, alas, probably not yet. Okay, most of the applications of quantum computers that you hear about, whether that's code breaking or, you know, Grover's algorithm for combinatorial search, are going to require error correction and fault tolerance to have any hope of outperforming a classical computer. Okay? There is some hope to eke out a near-term advantage for tasks like simulating quantum systems with little or no error correction. Okay, but I would say, you know, the claims that you see all over that we know how to use these near-term quantum computers to get practical speed-ups for optimization, for machine learning, for all these things, they're at least 95% BS. Okay, that, 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 that's only a lower bound, right? not, not an upper bound. Okay, uh, you know, now I did have a proposal a few years ago, which was, well, you know, could we take even the quantum supremacy experiments based on sampling that are being done, you know, already, could we just immediately repurpose them uh, as a source of cryptographically certified random bits? You know, so for example, for proof of stake cryptocurrencies, you know, next generation Ethereum, where, you know, you need a giant source of random bits that everyone trusts was not corrupted, right? From, you know, the outputs of these sampling experiments, you sort of get that, you know, as long as you can verify that, yes, you're really, you know, uh, uh, passing that linear cross entropy benchmark, then, you know, you get some kind of computational guarantee that these bits must have been generated from a quantum computer in more or less the correct way. And therefore, they must have a lot of true entropy in them. You know, can we exploit that fact for, you know, in a useful protocol? You know, if so, that might be the first realizable application of quantum computers. Okay, so finally, where to go next? Well, you know, the most obvious thing, do experiments that achieve a higher fidelity, you know, and a higher linear cross entropy score. So, you know, I don't think quantum supremacy is a done deal. I think we need to put more distance between, you know, the experiments and what classical spoofing algorithms are able to do. And the most important thing right now is not more qubits. It is more accuracy, okay? Higher uh, linear cross entropy score. Um, now, second, I think the biggest theoretical problem in this area is can we figure out how to do near-term quantum supremacy experiments, you know, without error correction, you know, like the ones that are being done today, but in a way where the outputs are easy to check with a classical computer. So where we don't need to use two to the n time, you know, with our classical computers, you know, to check what the quantum computer did. Because as long as that's the case, we're inherently limited to at most 50 or 60 qubits. You know, I would like to push ahead to 100 or 200 qubits, but for that we need faster ways to classically verify. And, you know, in principle we know how to do that, but only via schemes that seem to require error correction. So how can we do that in the near term? Okay, okay you know, and then there are lots of, the, you know, just fundamental uh, complexity theoretic questions that remain open about these experiments. Can we give better theoretical evidence that, you know, for example, even if a classical computer could only approximately simulate these experiments or only spoof the linear cross entropy benchmark, then that would imply the collapse of the polynomial hierarchy. You know, that's a, that's a beautiful open question. Um, can we get any applications? from these very near term, you know, or currently existing quantum computers. For example, useful simulations of quantum mechanics or, you know, useful cryptographic tasks like for cryptocurrencies. And then finally, of course, uh, can we demonstrate useful error correction, which is the technology that we really need to push forward and enable truly scalable quantum speed ups. So with that, uh, thank you for listening. Um, sorry for, um, uh, going over time, but I'm ha super happy to take any of your questions.
so Scott, first of all, thank you for a, an absolutely excellent presentation. And, and let's move on to those question and answers. Mm -hmm. We have several uh -huh. uh, in different areas, so I'm just going to be asking those randomly. Um, mm -hmm. There's a couple of people who have asked for references in your presentation, just so everyone knows. I'll remind you, we will have this uh, recorded and it will be distributed to the ACM website. So you can go back and review it for some of the links and other uh, topics that you looked at. But, you know, one question that I found pretty interesting was somebody asked, how long does it take to compute, it, uh, to compute uh, Alexi B? I thought maybe you could touch on that and that would lead into to the next question they have. How, how uh, long did it take to, to, to do computer? that? Sorry, to, how to, long to, did it take just to compute it? To, to compute it in general. They didn't ask for a specific price. Oh, like um, an example well, yeah, so, so as, um, um, as I said in the talk, you know, it takes roughly two to the end time, as far as we know, right? So, you know, it is about as hard to check these experiments as it is to spoof the experiments, right? They're, they're both, you know, two to the end, you know, with some minor improvements that you can get by, you know, exploiting the spatial locality of the qubits, you know, if the circuit is not very deep, you know, using what are called tensor network methods and, and, and various things like that. Um, now, uh, in um, the uh, 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 papers from Google and USTC, you know, because, you know, they're, they're most difficult uh, experiments or like, let's say they're, they're most impressive experiments with like 53 to 60 qubits were actually just too hard for them to verify directly using the resources they had. Okay, so they cheated a little bit. What they did was that they verified, you know, the results up to the limit, the number of qubits, you know, where they could do that, which, you know, I think was, was at least 40 or so qubits. And then for the full 50-something qubits, you know, what they did is they, uh, they sort of um, changed the circuit in ways that made it easy, easier to simulate classically, but that, you know, sort of plausibly the, the physical system wouldn't know about or care about. And they, you know, they did all of those sanity checks that, yeah, when you do that, when you make it easier to calculate LXCB, then, then, then you can, you know, you, you do indeed get the answer that you expect, right? So, um, you know, I, I do want to see sort of, you know, a, a sort of direct verification of, you know, an experiment with, you know, ideally with, let's say, you know, 55 or 60 qubits, uh, you know, that, that, that verification, I think, is within the supercomputing resources of our civilization, okay? It will cost many millions of dollars of supercomputing time to do, but, you know, if you, uh, if, you know, if someone... Yeah. You know, sp spends and I you know I know actually I was a reviewer for uh, the um, uh, one of the boson sampling uh, experiments from USTC and I asked them to do this direct verification and they they came back uh, with their you know response to referees and they said okay we did it but you know we went up to forty photons but we've burned half a million dollars of supercomputer time to do it so we're so we decided to stop there I realized that was by far the most expensive referee report I had ever written. Well, and Scott, that leads to a, a, an interesting question around boson sampling, which is what do yeah. you think are the applications of boson sampling, uh, like the quantum one-way function, you know, yeah. versus, um, you know, working on quantum supremacy? Like, are there particular applications yeah. that seem promising to you? So, um, the, the truth of the matter is that I don't know if boson sampling has applications, okay? It... Um, can be, you know, it, it, it could be used for generating cryptographically certified random bits, you know, just like uh, the uh, superconducting uh, uh, random circuit sampling uh, could be used for that. Uh, you know, with um, uh, boson sampling, I'd say that, that the issues there are, you know, a little bit murkier than, than they are uh, uh, with uh, uh, superconducting qubits, just because, you know, we don't have a clear enough conjecture about how well a classical spoofing algorithm can do for boson sampling. Um, you know, now there have been claims over the past five or six years to do, you know, other things with boson sampling, uh, like, you know, that it could help with graph isomorphism. It could help with, you know, detecting clusters in, in graphs, uh, uh, in, in networks. It could help with, um, what are called Frank Condon profiles in 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 chemistry. Um, uh, you know, uh, the uh, startup company Xanadu uh, was behind some of these claims. Now, unfortunately, 
if you really do a fair comparison against the best that the best algorithms that we know for a classical computer. Uh, I am not convinced that any of these things demonstrate real quantum speed ups. Okay, and uh, you know, in, in some cases, it's for non-trivial reasons that classical algorithms are able to match the performance. But you know, that seems to be the situation that we're still looking for an application of boson sampling where it actually, uh, you know, it actually generates an answer that we care about and that a classical algorithm, you know, could not have, have efficiently generated. That's awesome. Well, you know, let's talk about qubits for a second. What prevents sure. a qubit state from remaining usable or stable for more than, you know, 10, 10 microseconds or whatever? And, and what will enable that time to be extended to, to seconds or, or to infinity? Yeah, that's an, that's an excellent question. And, you know, of course, it's very, very central to this whole field. Uh, so, you know, I didn't have time to get into this in my talk. But, you know, the, the central technological difficulty with keeping qubits stable is um, uh, that, you know, they have to be isolated, right? So, uh, uh, you know, a, a being in superposition is something that, you know, physical systems like to do in private when no one is looking at them, okay? As soon as, you know, someone looks at them, then, you know, they, they want to collapse to, you know, one outcome or the other, and it doesn't have to be a person who looks, okay? Any stray, you know, radiation or air or anything else in the environment that carries away that, inf carries away information about whether that qubit is a zero or one will have exactly the same effect on the qubit as if someone had measured it. Okay, so uh, um, you know, so so you have to keep your qubits, you know, incredibly well isolated from you know what we call decoherence, you know, loss of quantum coherence from interaction with the environment. But they can't be perfectly isolated because they have to be interacting with each other, and in a way that you know we precisely choreographed. Okay, so you know these are enormous technological problems. Um, but, you know, the good news is that, you know, there's been immense progress on them over the past 25 years. Okay, so uh, from, you know, maybe just nanosecond times, you know, we, we now have superconducting qubits that, you know, can maintain their state for some tens of microseconds. You know, and that's very far from the record, by the way. I mean, there are other systems like what are called nitrogen vacancy centers in Diamond, where you can keep a qubit stable for minutes or even hours or days, okay? The, but the trouble there is sitting there doing nothing, right? And so you also want to be, in, you know, doing computation on the qubits while also keeping them stable, right? And that's that's a that's a harder problem, okay? But um, the you know so so we know you know technological way you know engineering ways that we can extend the lifetime of qubits. And we see that because they have those lifetimes have been extended by orders of magnitude since the experimentalists started doing this stuff in the mid '90s. Okay, but the ultimate solution, you know, the thing that would let us keep the qubit stable for arbitrarily long times while also doing any operations we want with them, that would be quantum error correction and quantum fault tolerance. That is exactly why it's so important. Well, super cool, Scott. I'm afraid we've run out of time today. I know we have a ton of questions. Actually, mm -hmm. you know, I've hosted an ACM event before, and I have to tell you, Scott, there are more questions than I saw by an order of magnitude, which is awesome to see. Mm -hmm. I, I'd like to thank Scott again for his uh, presentation. I thought it was absolutely wonderful and very insightful on those Q and A answers as well. Special thanks to each of you for taking the time to attend and participate today. Um, as we said, this talk was recorded and it will be available online in a few days at learning.acm.org. And you can find announcements on upcoming talks and other ACM activities at that same website or at acm.org. Um, if you could, please take a few moments to fill out the quick survey at the end where you can suggest future topics or speakers. Um, and you should see that on your screen at this point. And on behalf of the ACM, Scott Aronson and myself, Worley, thanks again for joining us. And I hope you will all join us again in the future. This will conclude the talk for today. Thank you so much, Scott. Thank you, everyone. Thanks so much for having me.